This is the lab identification of metal ions and their inorganic compounds by the chemical reactions in the, uh, from the general chemistry lab manual. So the main purpose of this lab is to uh, practice a lot of precipitation reactions. So you'll have a lot of different solutions of different compounds and you'll observe the formation of precipitates. And then, so you'll do this with two different sets of uh, cations and anions. And then you'll also have an unknown, which is one of the cation solutions uh, from each test. So, um, so then you're going to look at the reaction pattern and basically use that to predict the identity of the unknown. So you're gonna have two sets of tests um, one is uh, with barium, magnesium, lead, cobalt, and iron. Uh, all the, uh, I guess the iron is actually three plus, and then the anions are listed there. You're also going to do what's called high and low concentrations of hydroxide and high and low concentrations of uh, ammonia. And then test two is also, um, it's all described very well in the lab notebook, barium, zinc, lead, copper, and sodium with the various uh, anions listed there. So, um, the reason we're doing this is really just sent basic uh, reaction chemistry, being able to write net ionic equations, which is sort of the post-lab part of this, um, and also just making observations about color changes, sort of careful uh, reaction-based observations, which is a really a key part of chemistry, is to be able to do reactions and predict what happens. Now, if we think about it, we should know from solubility rules where things should be soluble, okay? And so we've reviewed those. You're usually not asked to memorize them, but you should go back to that because that should help you be able to predict what's going to happen with these. Now there is a bit of a wrinkle as it comes to um, these reactions in that it's not just simple solubility rules because some things can make an initially an insoluble product and then if you use Le Chatelier's principle and just keep adding more and more, let's say, of the anion, you can eventually push it into something we call a complex ion, which becomes soluble again. So you see this trend of something that is insoluble and then becomes soluble. And the two places where this is really most important is with hydroxide and with ammonia. And so these are the two you're gonna to have to be very careful with because you can make complex ions with hydroxide and with ammonia. And now ammonia is a little even more complicated because um, in reality, ammonia in water is actually ammonium hydroxide. So it is a, a weak base and for a, 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 a source of OH minus. And so if you get a precipitate with ammonia, you need to interpret that as reacting with the OH minus. Now what can happen is if you add enough concentration of ammonia, you can actually get complex ions with the ammonia as the anion. And so this is where you're going to have to be careful. So at high, so you're doing these high and low concentrations of hydroxide and ammonia, and you want to be very careful when you're observing it as to whether or not you get precipitates or not. So this can be a little bit hard to determine. So, um, so you're going to want with those to be, you know, observe each drop as sort of as it goes in and see if you have a precipitate, then potentially maybe then goes back into solution. Okay, we're really only going to worry right now about the formulas of the precipitates. We're not gonna worry about the formulas of the complex ions. That is something that we deal with in great detail in uh, Gen Chem uh, 3, so in Chem 115, and we'll get to that uh, eventually. So you're gonna do this lab in pairs. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward lab, but you just need a high level of execution and organization. That's really the hard part for this lab. Now in terms of changes from the lab manual, one section has you make up sort of your dilute form of sodium hydroxide and ammonia. You'll have to do it with ammonia, but you want to do it with sodium hydroxide because it's actually one of the bottles. And so really the key here is making sure you know the labels because they're the same compounds, sometimes at different concentrations, and also that you know on your test tube rack then how that lays out in terms of which tube goes where. So you can use the tables in the lab manual. I highly encourage bringing the lab manual into to lab this week to make sure that you know how to lay it out. So you don't necessarily have to, you don't have to necessarily write everything out in the in your lab notebook this week because it's really a challenge. But you'll need to check with your instructor. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to allow you to use the centrifuge to maybe identify whether you have a pellet or not. In terms of safety, we'll talk a little bit about the centrifuge. By far, that's your biggest concern is potentially uh, having being injured from improper uh, centrifuge use. So in terms of execution, um, we're gonna give you these special racks. Each group has sort of, each person has sort of 12 test tubes. So between the two of you, you can set up the grid uh, in your rack and then it's basically just follow the procedures. Four drops of each one. 
you can identify how you want to do that. My suggestion is to do it just like the uh, manual has it laid out in sort of a grid. And at that point, then you will, um, uh, you know, so if you want to set up all your cations first and then add the anions and make the observation. Again, I think the key, um, some of these will be very easy to identify, like that one obviously is forming a precipitate. But especially with the ammonia and with the hydroxide, you're going to want to make some observations sort of along the way. And so here I'm just adding all five of them now. In terms of mixing uh, tubes, you're not, you know, you don't have a huge amount of um, uh, volume there. So the best way to do these is typically with a um, finger flick. Um, so uh, I, as I'm demonstrating there, and um, and just do that. But the key here. Is keeping track of your bottles and making sure you're adding the right thing because this lab turns out to be a nightmare if you screw that part up. With, so with some of these uh, experiments where you get a precipitate and it's maybe a little hard to be sure, you can put them in the centrifuge. The key is to make sure that you evenly balance it just like a dish uh, washing machine. So you want to make sure that each tube kind of has, is, has a partner across from it that has really the same uh, mass roughly the same balance so you can just use a balance tube with just plain water um, you could use another tube uh, that, that you've made something with and you just turn it on and let it centrifuge it doesn't take very long and then um, you can turn it off and it'll sort of ding now the key is when you turn it off is don't try to uh, let it slow down on its own don't use your finger to try to slow it down that's a good way to basically screw up your finger because you can break, the tube will break. Um, if you watched movies, uh, there's a few movies where basically global pandemics and zombie apocalypses have been started by people trying to stick their hand in centrifuges with blood. Now granted, you're probably not gonna start the zombie apocalypse in this lab, but let's, uh, let's, not, be, uh, let's not be too sure. Okay, so when you're uh, done with a particular rack, let's collect all the waste into a, uh, some sort of waste beaker at your bench. Um, you know, you'll have potentially, you know, 20 to 24 test tubes. Try to get as most of it out that you can. And then you can just wash it, uh, the rest in the sink with the DI water. We have uh, appropriate test tube brushes and um, that are perfect for those things. And so just wash them out real well and, and that'll be fine. Then when you're completely done, you can use the hazardous aqueous waste to basically dump the uh, waste into the uh, aqueous waste container and then you'll be set. So. If you need help learning how to use that then you can ask me. Alright, at the end of the lab basically you'll have these tables from your lab manual that will have your various observations in terms of uh, which ones form precipitates and which ones don't. Um, you'll have an unknown, you'll pick an unknown A or B that'll be one of the solutions and you'll have to identify what solution that is and then hopefully all your waste is in the hazardous aqueous waste container. So the post lab of this is really going to focus on writing like the net ionic equations for the compounds that did form precipitates that's really by far the the skill that we're going to practice the most but if you have any questions about anything please be sure to see uh, your lab instructor